Thank you. At some point in our lives, we're going to be profoundly affected by these six chronic conditions. One in, ten of, one in 10 diabetes, one in five mental health. We're going to have stories to tell, stories about how we were affected or how our loved one was affected by these chronic conditions. I'm going to add a seventh condition, and that's cancer. There are people who are living many years and even decades now with cancer. These seven conditions alone consume 75% of all health spending. Just these seven conditions. The stories we tell will be personal. For me, my mother was diagnosed with cancer when I was 10 years old. That diagnosis led to a clinical depression that she had for the rest of her life. She was hospitalized more for the depression than she was for the cancer, and that's, that's what I remember the most. More recently, my father, his kidneys failed. He went on dialysis for many years. He had a kidney transplant, that didn't go well. Back onto dialysis only to have a stroke. He fully recovered from the stroke only to have another stroke before succumbing to heart failure. My story is not unique. I know, I know for a fact that you have these stories too. And if you don't have a story, I'm afraid you're gonna you're going to have a story at some point in your life, and that's why this is so important. When, um, when my father passed away, a good friend of mine, Alex, he came to me, and he came up to me and gave me a great big hug. He always gives me big hugs, but this was a bigger, deeper hug. And he said to me, Joe, he said to me, I'm sorry for your loss. But just remember that you're next. And I know what he meant. I know what he was trying to get across. He was trying to tell me simply that life is fragile. We're here only for a finite period of time. And we should just live, we shouldn't just live, we should just live well. How do we live well with chronic conditions? How is the healthcare system going to support us? I've worked in a hospital my entire career, and I can tell you that hospitals do a fantastic job at dealing with chronic disease when they get really, really bad. But they're not built for chronic illness. Your family doctor, they do the best they can as well, but they really can only spend about 15 minutes with you per visit. I think the obvious component is the patient themselves. What's the patient's role? What I've learned over the course of my career, and in particular the last 10 years, is that patients have this immense capacity to care for themselves. They can do incredible things given the opportunity. This is the woman who changed my opinion. 10 years ago, Yvonne Massey was a 27-year-old, just recently married, getting ready to start a family. And then something unexpected happened. She, her kidneys failed completely and permanently. You can't live very long without kidney function. She was rushed into a dialysis unit with other renal function patients here. Uh, she was put on a dialysis machine, uh, an artificial kidney, to clean her blood just enough to keep her alive. The other thing she was told is that this idea of her caring for, this idea of her starting a, a family was not on. The toxins in her blood were such that she probably wouldn't conceive, and she unlikely would bring the pregnancy to term. This was not the plan. She was devastated. She was on dialysis for more than a year, to the point where she was so depressed that she actually asked her husband to leave her. This was not the plan. Then something happened. Dr. Chris Chan from Toronto General started this highly experimental program, unproven, known as home hemodialysis. The idea is pretty simple. You put the dialysis machine in the patient's home, you train them how to use a dialysis machine, and they can dialyze more frequently. Instead of you know, 12 hours of dialysis week, a week in, in a hospital, you could get 50 or 60 hours while you sleep. Yvonne signed up for this, but it seems kind of crazy, right? Like, look at the machine, right? She was trained on this in as little as six weeks. She was very determined. She was only a handful of patients around the world who were doing this at the time. It was unproven. 
Now, learning how the machine is one thing. There's another major detail is this. She needed to insert these needles into her arm on her own. These are not little needles. These are big needles, and there's two of them. And she has to do this on a daily basis. She did it. She went on daily dialysis, and she was actually, she actually conceived. But the specialist that she was given, she actually told her that, you know what, you should terminate this pregnancy. It's too high risk. You're not going to bring it to term, and you're risking your own life. Yvonne had gone way too far down this road in order to turn back now. Nine months later, Matthew was born. And you know what? A year later, Marie Saginot had another child, Matteo. This is Marie Saginot now. And there were others. There was Bella Agarwal with her dialysis machine, cradling her newborn son. There was a bit of a baby boom at Toronto General as a result of this, right? Women who normally would not have had the ability to bring pregnancies to term were bringing healthy children to term, children that norm normally would not have been able to uh, be conceived or otherwise brought to term. These women were not unique. There are tens of thousands of patients now doing home hemodialysis. What they did was incredible, but they were not unique. Given the right circumstances, these patients were able to do amazing things, to be able to care for themselves given the right circumstances. And the other thing, amazing thing, is this costs $10,000 a year less than conventional dialysis per patient per year. This is my father the way I like to remember him when I was a child, when he was healthy. He was on dialysis when I was learning about home hemodialysis. I was telling him about the health benefits. And he said, Joe, you know, I understand the benefits, but I can't do it, and this is the reason why. The technology was just way too complicated. He's, he was technically inclined, but he just felt he couldn't do it. And I'm a biomedical engineer by, by training, and I'm very thankful of the science and the engineering that went into this technology that kept my father alive for so many years, but I'm often, quite frankly, a bit ashamed and embarrassed at my profession as to how we make technologies far too complex. Unnecessarily complex, a barrier for patients to use. If we're serious about this, if we're really serious about this, how could we design technologies for patients to care for themselves, to unlock this ability for them to care for themselves? What, how could we do it? Let's start with an example that we tried. Now, I'll, I say this affectionately, but this is a, a bit of a difficult group, teenagers. They're re not really well known for caring for themselves, right? Like, I have a teenager, and uh, I love him to death, but the idea of him caring for himself is a, is a work in progress. <laughs> I think he's just recently discovered bathing. <laughs> All right? But, you know, he's, he's perfectly healthy. He doesn't have a chronic illness, but imagine layering type 1 diabetes on top of everything else a teenager is going through. They need to test their blood sugars on a regular basis. And you know what? You can tell them all you want. You can tell them about the consequences of diabetes, that you know, when they're 30, their kidneys may fail. When they're 40, they may go blind. When they're 50, they may lose a limb. But they're 15, they're invincible, they, they don't hear this. 30, 40, 50, that's old, right? What if we could create a technology for them that's not this, this is the clunky technology they use now, this meter that just spews out a result and they have to write it down in a, in a little booklet. What if we could create a technology that was on their terms, that had this ability to unlock their, their ability to care for themselves using perhaps a smartphone? And that's what we did, was we created an app called Bant. Right? And BANT is, is directed towards them and trying to allow them to care for themselves more effectively. And this is how BANT works. So you take your test strip, you apply it to your glucometer just like you normally would. You take your blood sample, you apply the blood sample. And this glucometer has been modified. We modified it to communicate to the iPhone over Bluetooth. It automatically launches the, the app. 
and the blood sugars tra start transferring automatically. <laughs> and you know, they're now in context. There's all there, there. You can look at your breakfast and your lunch readings. You can look at trends, not just the static reading. And there's even a social community so that other, these kids can connect with other kids with type 1 diabetes. We also introduced a rewards program so that they get experience points for every reading they take. They get a two times multiply for taking consecutive readings, and they get bonus points for taking a full five readings per day. And they could accumulate these, level up, and then they get iTunes redemption codes to buy music and apps. <laughs> oh, hold on. So we tried this, we tried this at, at Sick Kids for three months, and these kids tested almost 50% more frequently using BANT than in the three months previous. It's pretty good, eh? It's, uh, it's not like giving birth, but it's a start, right? <laughs> so, you know, this is just the start of Bant. And, and by the way, Bant is named after Frederick Banting, the great Canadian who discovered insulin more than 90 years ago right here in Toronto. <laughs> so I have another example, uh, this time adults with type 2 diabetes who also have a serious comorbidity known as high blood pressure. This is very serious. We did the same thing, this time with a Blackberry. Okay, hey, <laughs> easy. I love REM still, and they supported some of this research, so please. Okay. So, so we take the Blackberry, and it's communicating with a Bluetooth-enabled blood pressure monitor. So we took two groups. We took one group that just had a clunky old blood pressure monitor, and we took another one that was Bluetooth-enabled, that communicated with their BlackBerry running our app that had reminders that would communicate serious blood pressure readings to their family doctor. And we tracked this over a year, and this is what we found. The, the group that had the clunky old blood pressure monitor, there was no change in their blood pressure over that period of time. Now, the group that had the, the BlackBerry system, they saw a 20% drop in their risk of heart attack and stroke over that one-year period. An app that saves lives. And the other incredible thing is that the physicians had nothing to do with it. We looked at the records. There was no additional medications prescribed. There was no additional visits. The management was about the same. These were patients caring for themselves. They were engaged. They were self-aware. They took their medications on a regular basis, whereas the group with just the conventional blood pressure monitor, unfortunately, hypertension is, doesn't have any s symptoms. So they probably forgot to take their blood pressure measurements. They probably talk, forgot to take their medications, and that's the cycle that happens. This is really a behavioral intervention. There's so much more to be done. We're just scratching the surface here. Who's going to design the dialysis machine of the future? Something that my father could have used, the, the next generation diabetes app, an, an app for asthma care or, or heart failure. That's where I want to turn to you. I know there's some very talented people in this audience. There's designers and engineers, there's entrepreneurs, there's behavioralists, social scientists, people in marketing. I ask you to consider taking a road less traveled, that in healthcare. There's a huge opportunity for you. And I know you're thinking, I don't know anything about diabetes or heart failure or healthcare in general. Well, actually, this is where a bit of naivete is okay. Right? We don't want you to bring baggage from the existing paradigm of healthcare into this new paradigm where patients are empowered to care for themselves. Think about it, please. The other basic thing we need to do is patients need access to their personal health information. David DePronkhart, cancer patient, he has a very simple message to providers, give me my damn data because I need that data in order to care for myself. Just like my good friend and mentor, Kevin Leonard. Kevin's been dealing with serious chronic illness for 40 years. His partner, Sandy, has been by his side for 30 of those years to helping him manage his condition. He has more than 20 specialists dealing with all aspects of chronic illness. But he still doesn't have basic access to his personal health information, the information he needs to care for himself more effectively. There's no technical reason why we can't do this, no regulatory, no privacy reason why we can't do this. We need to get this done. I say to you again, these seven conditions will consume us. 75% of all spending, we will be affected by this in our lifetime. 
we have a choice to make in terms of creating a system and creating technologies to move us to this new paradigm. We're going to need access to our personal health information. We're going to need tools to manage our care. We're going to need people like you to care to create these tools. And we're going to need a system that allow us to engage. This is Yvonne Maffey today, 10 years later. She's doing great. Now with her two boys, Matthew and Nicholas. She's still on home hemodialysis. She still takes those two great big needles and she inserts them into her arm on a regular basis. She's a very brave person, but she's not unique. She's simply one of many patients, given the right circumstances, are able to care for themselves and do incredible things. The story that Matthew and Nicholas will tell their mother will be much different than the story that I told to my parents. There will be stories of how their mother overcame chronic illness and, and did amazing things. I want all of us to be able to have these great stories. You and I. Not just stories of us living, but stories of us living very well. Thank you.